Wonderful. So, thank you. Good morning. Uh, yes, so we're from Eden Technologies. We develop in-ear EEG devices, and we've been doing collaborations with other research groups, such as Supsi and Luigi. So, it was very cool to kick that off, seeing the results that they've been able to achieve with uh, machine learning, with uh, good signal quality. Um, a lot of the motivation that we have with developing these types of devices, you know, as Francesca said, we can already collect a lot of very high quality data in the laboratory and clinical settings, but we miss the longitudinal story, you know, in between doing a sleep analysis once a week, once a month, once a year. How many times are people going to do this, especially if they don't already have a disease indication? Um, we essentially want to take a lot of the inspiration that we have from smartwatches, which is to collect data over a longitudinal time period, which can be applied also to either consumer health or hopefully in the future also medical situations. Um, sleep, of course, is one of our focus areas because if everyone is sleeping, everyone has a brain, um, we've talked about this problem already, but to be able to have higher, more accurate data about sleep throughout a person's life, not just over you know, a small uh, treatment period, means we can start to really address other things that we're, we don't necessarily understand how we can connect to, to sleep. For example, Alzheimer's, neurodegenerative disease, longi longitudinal characterizations of longevity. These are some of the things that I think we'll be able to capture when we have more accurate, more mobile um, devices which are actually capturing brain activity. Um, when we can then combine these with other wearables or other sensors, for example, collecting what's happening in the heart, what are you doing as a, as a person, the motions that you're doing throughout a day, and then connecting that also with what's happening in the brain, I believe we create a very nice foundation for not only understanding a lot of the diseases and disorders that we're addressing, but really going beyond that and potentially understanding new things about our, our lives. So from a one perspective, we come at the development of in-ear EEG to see how we can really capture all these determinations of, of a person, not necessarily just us as a company, but also working with other organizations or making that technology available for people to, to utilize it. So we talk about uh, consumer devices, consumer trackers, uh, I wear a smartwatch. This is uh, data from my smartwatch. <laughs> it's it's a one indication for how I can start to measure what's happening in my life, right? Basically how much I moved, basically how much I was sleeping. But one of the key indications that we miss is really what's the quality? How do, how do we really understand what's happening with us as a people outside of the clinical environment? So. There's a number of different brain-computer uh, interfaces and imaging technologies that we can use to understand the brain, going from non-invasive to very invasive, uh, things like Neuralink, where we actually are implanting electrodes into, into the person's brain. And you've probably seen great results, perhaps on YouTube and Twitter, with uh, patients playing chess, for example, or starting to replace speech. And this is great, but this is something which is an invasive procedure very difficult to do, and also if we use more advanced magnetic uh, imaging techniques or fMRIs, these are things that we can do at certain points throughout a person's life, but we want to fill in that gap, that longitudinal understanding of what's happening to your brain. And that's one reason why we focus on using EEG. So EEG is a imaging method for the brain where we capture this small electrical potentials at the surface of the, of the, of the person's body. Um, traditionally, when we look at EEG, we also can realize that this is something which has been developed over many decades, so we consider it to be a relatively um, stable technology which we can then build upon. But at the, at the end of the day, EEG is relatively straightforward. We have neurons firing in the brain. When there are bigger collections of neurons firing, we have some electrical um, impulse that we can measure at the person's scalp. Um, or we can measure from inside the ear canal. So the, the way to develop the system is relatively straightforward. We need to amplify the signal, and we need to have some electrical contact to the person's skin. And EEG has gone through a lot of iterations with different electrodes, because we want to really look at how different electrodes can allow us to create devices which can be used throughout a person's life. 
This means researchers have considered different materials such as um, metals as well as polymers. And having conductive soft polymers is really one, one of the key things that we're developing, um, not just at Eden, but also at, at different companies. Because when we, when we um, use dry electrode technology, which really integrates with a person's lifestyle, it means that we don't have to go through the process of, for example, putting wet electrodes onto a person's scalp. Um, traditionally, when we do EEG in the clinic, we put on electrode gel. You do a sleep study, and then in the morning, you wash your hair for 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, and sometimes the electrode gel is quite robust and difficult to get out even after uh, two days, which I know from personal experience. Um, so beyond, beyond the, you know, Luigi showed there's really amazing stuff that we can do with machine learning, but it all starts from a good signal quality. So when a person is sitting in front of a, an EEG from, from a night of a patient, what are they looking for? Well, they're looking for very specific changes in the electrical time-based signal that was recorded during the night. So there are different, what we call uh, neuromarkers or biomarkers for what's happening in sleep, and this has been developed um, going back, I think, till the 1950s with uh, Lomas in one of the first publications where they characterized the sleep journey from EEG. So it's really interesting as a, a problem because we can start from that foundation and then just make sure that we can find that signal in the device that we're developing. So things like sleep spindles, K-complexes, we're essentially taking the time-based signal and looking um, at a certain frequency range of it. So we, we, if we can characterize the time-based signal from 1 hertz or 10 to 12 hertz, then we can extract those narrow markers that we need to enable machine learning, to enable uh, sleep staging, and really taking uh, sleep out of the clinic. Now, traditionally, and this is also from my brain, uh, from a sleep study in Lugano about two years ago, uh, we take the time-based signals and then traditionally they're going to be put through a fast Fourier transform so that we see the relative change in frequency throughout the night. So things like alpha activity are going to show up in the 10 to 12 hertz range. Slow brain or slow wave activity will be in the 1 to 3 hertz range. So automatically you can see from one picture more or less what happened during my night. But if you're not an expert in sleep technology, um, it's going to be unclear if... I might be suffering from depression, or maybe I have other sleep indications that are going to be requiring treatment uh, later on. So traditionally, when we think about EEG, we think about a scalp device that's going into a clinical um, environment. And it's very accurate, but it's not something that's very easy to put on during the day, as uh, we, we've talked about in the past. But it has very accurate signal. Um, now there's more mobile EEG hardware that has been coming onto the market over the past decades. Um, some of these are more consumer focused, some of them are actually medical devices for collecting EEG with dry electro technology. So we were all going to, trying to build this beautiful device which we can just put on and it just collects brain data and that's all we have to do. That's the dream for all these different uh, product developers. Uh, in industry and medical and also in the research fields. Um, to a certain extent it works, but it's also true that mm, there's a very small subset of the population that would be able to wear these devices throughout the day um, because we also have societal norms where we have accepted things like watches. When we made the watches electrical, it wasn't that big of a problem um, because people already liked to wear watches. The same reason that we can augment ourselves with glasses no one is going to be ostracized for, for wearing glasses, but occasionally some people are ostracized if they put on new augmented reality glasses and they might get beat up in a parking lot because people feel that, that new technology is invasive in society. So from a product development standpoint, we're trying to develop something which is already the thing that we use. So earbuds have been developed over past decades. They've gone from devices which are just collecting voice um, interaction from us or presenting audio to things which are actually tracking our movement, tracking our heart rate. And then the next step will be also tracking sleep. Um, there are other companies on the market which are really looking at using hearables to enhance sleep. Uh, Bose had their sleep buds. It's now been spun off into another company called Oslo. 
where they're releasing sleep buds where you use um, acoustics, so audio to help enhance the sleep journey. That could be sleep onset or increasing sleep time. Also, LG released their Breeze Buds. Uh, these were really released just on the South Korean market till now. They are EEG buds, which do measure EEG um, in a true LS form factor. Although I wouldn't say that the, the signal from them is extremely great. And one of the problems that they had was really the electrode material that they were using. So a lot of challenges with soft electrode materials and really bringing that to scale. So what we're doing at EDUN is to start with the hypothesis, can we make in-ear EEG? Can we go from full scalp signals to in-ear signals with enough quality to actually be useful for anything? And being useful for sleep was really important because of the way that we could impact uh, society in the market. So we developed over a couple of years um, a, a few generations of different electrode materials to measure EEG electrical signals from inside the ear canal. That started with conductive fabrics, with foam, which is what all researchers also start with in industry or in research, uh, and eventually came to different coatings, and then eventually we came to injection moldable um, electrodes, which feel like normal electrodes, which you can actually put into your ear, and which actually do collect electrolyte activity. Um, and now we're in the pos position where we are trying to form this into a, a product form which is really usable and very comfortable, because even though we can sleep with PSG systems in the laboratory and collect high quality data, it's difficult, it's not very natural. We want to have systems which are going to feel natural. So if you're falling asleep right now, we would like to capture that activity. We would have to know you're going to fall asleep in this lecture and then we have to put an EEG cap to capture the activity. If we were just wearing um, an easy to use device, we could, we could understand your sleep activity better during the day. So that's like our basic thesis. And then we thought to ourselves, okay, we can, if we can capture sleep activity during the day, we can look at things like narcolepsy, we can look at things that, like fatigue, if we can capture sleep activity during the night. We can also look at um, addressing how PSG systems can be applied to the home market. So to do this, we did benchmarking against gold standard uh, EEG devices. In this case, uh, Summonomedics PSG device. Study sub is relatively straightforward. Um, we want to capture data during an evening, during multiple nights where people are sleeping, capture the brain activity, look at how we can sleep stage the device and the, the, the output. And what we were able to see through manual sleep scoring is that we could achieve approximately um, 0.68 agreement across different sleep stages for different individuals. In this case, we're capturing with uh, 10 participants. And looking side by side, we could see that we could capture signals with the same character as the PSG system. So going from a, a sleep state to an awake state, capturing sleep spindles, capturing K complexes, this opened up the possibility where we can augment or we can go beyond a bit what we're able to understand from sleep activity using traditional wearables like smartwatches, and then really go to the source, to the brain. So this was a nice first indication also that if we look at the, 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 the whole night activity, we can see very similar transitions between the different frequency components. And then we thought, okay, how can we use automatic sleep staging? Can we just apply these algorithms or would there have to be training and enhancement? So we started with traditional systems like the yet another sleep um, classifier algorithm, which is uh, one of the open source algorithms that we can capture from, from the internet and has been validated in different scenarios. And we saw that um, we can capture a lot of the awake and asleep uh, behaviors. But then we start to fail when we're capturing things like N3. And I think it really gets to the point where, you know, there would also be differentiation between individuals um, evaluating that sleep behavior. We, we see there's a lot of room for um, improvement. Um, but when we also started to apply other algorithms like the odds ratio product, um, we, we started to get the impression that if we we, we basically have the, the, I would say like 70%. So just from the basic signal, being able to apply it to different algorithms gives us the potential to really stage sleep behavior. 
So we're at the foundation where we want to improve upon this, work with other researchers who can develop algorithms to fill in the, the blanks that we have um, from, the, from the company. And we're also looking at how we can then apply different signal classifiers in our in energy signal, for example, extracting um, eye movement to then answer the problems that we have with REM uh, identification. And this is like the foundation that we provided. We're looking forward to building out, seeing how different architectures can really enhance sleep characterization and then also move to different lifestyle factors. Um, and I think large language models will really have a, a solid way to go forward on this. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Looking forward to having questions, conversations in between, and let me know if you want your brainwaves measured. Thank you. Thank you.